to uh, if he would give a presentation at our meeting. And uh, I actually um, thought it was a long shot, and I was extremely pleased when he agreed uh, to give this presentation. Uh, he uh, was uh, chief of staff for House Committee on Science, George, uh, George Brown, the uh, chairman of the committee. And he spent a lot of time on the National Research, uh, Research Council Space Studies Board. Are you, I don't know if you're still on it. No, I just okay. term limited it all. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay. Uh, and currently is at uh, the University of Colorado Cooperative Institute for <coughs> Research and, and Environmental Sciences. So please welcome uh, Rad Byerly. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, uh, that was the first first thing I was going to talk about is that I, I'd sort of come with a very much a congressional perspective, which which is useful in that uh, it's very it's a different perspective. It's independent of the administration or NASA, and it's uh, it's some it's a perspective you have to learn to deal with as in the United States. And I know Congress often looks like a bunch of fools, but it's it's what we have. Uh, so I also spent. Uh, Four years at uh, the University of Colorado as a running an independent uh, space policy research center, and I'll come back and miss that, but m mention that later. Uh, but anyway, it's a different. Perspective. This whole talk is going to be compared to the other talks. It's going to be uh, anecdotal and sordid. So I'm not talking about optimization, but I am talking about doing better than we have been doing in some things. And a lot, there's a lot of personal experience, but I'll, and then I'll sort of say, here's what we could do better. I'm going to mention some things I think we should do to do things better. And they are there, and my, the whole thing is sort of to try to shock people out of the ruts that they've been in, rather than and the agency in particular, the main agency that we're talking about. Uh, so I think the existing situation in, the, in what's really going on is, is not very helpful to developing a useful space, space environmental ethic or a space ethic of any kind. Maybe we could do things differently and do better. Must not optimize but improve, and maybe do good enough to satisfy, as Herb Simon would say. So, can we go to the <coughs> next situation, next view graph, first real view graph? Uh, and what I'm going to say is that describing the present situation is, in effect, an argument that we need to change. So, I'm going to go through not a systematic, comprehensive description of the present situation. But at different aspects of it, I think a systematic, comprehensive talk would be very boring. And it's late in the afternoon, so let's try to stay awake with a few little vignettes. And you could add your own vignettes. Uh, one thing I would say in the in the uh, fact of the existing situation is that uh, we're going to have major and if we keep going where we are now, NASA involvement in everything but weather satellites for a long, long time. I think we want to move away from that, but I don't think it's in any foreseeable future just because of expenses of what we want to do. Not to say there won't be the occasional space tourist, but I'm talking about the center of gravity. Okay, a fact that something that always has bothered in a sense, bothering me in the sense that I don't understand it. Uh, I do understand that space programs, NASA, astronauts, space scientists are tremendously popular with the broad public, with special public. Uh, recently I was asked to set up a speaker for a, a bunch of judges that were meeting on sort of a professional judge meeting. Uh, the person, the judge organizing the lunch speaker for one of the days wanted somebody from space, and I was able to get Matt Mountain from the Hubble Space Telescope Science Institute to give the speech. 
And he did a wonderful job, and a lot of beautiful pictures, and you know, you see, and he was up talking. He couldn't hear, but I was, I was invited to come watch it since I had put it together. Uh, I could hear these judges. I didn't know anything about space, just going, when every new thing would come, they'd, ooh, and ah, and wow. And here, these people are fairly sophisticated people. They're not sophisticated in s about space the way we are, but generally sophisticated people. They were just blown away. And I was so glad I was there because I could hear all these expressions of enthusiasm. He couldn't hear them, it turned out, up at the podium, which was 30, 40 feet away. Uh, despite this great popularity, I find that NASA is just tremendously defensive about any kind of external criticism or anything. And I'll, I'll mention my center. Uh, I was running at the University of Colorado in space policy. And I was an independent center. I had a little money from NASA, but mostly a foundation grant. Uh, and the person who gave me the money from NASA never put any pressure on me. But somebody higher up in, and it was a minor part of my funding anyway, higher up in NASA, uh, people were upset. And when I left that center, they put pressure on a major NASA grantee at the University of Colorado to go to the vice chancellor or whoever it was. And, and uh, they shut down my center because it, it was vacant and I had left. And they, I don't know whether they made a political calculation or if they just didn't know that I was going to go and be the chief of staff of their main jurisdictional committee. I, but uh, I think that was a stupid thing to do. But on the, on, the, on the other hand, I felt being a staff member, I couldn't do anything. It would have been unethical for me to try to prevent them from doing whatever the hell they wanted to do. I even had a book, book coming out that was just published about that time, and I, I really wanted to go to people. At, it was a book on space policy. I wanted to go to NASA and say, you guys ought to read this, but I never did that. You can probably still get books remaindered uh, if you want to buy a copy. <laughs> Not many sold. Uh, so that, that really seemed kind of silly to me. Uh, I, I didn't know, I just heard that. I did, nobody came to me and said shut down the center, but my, re my replacement as an interim center director told me this story. So I, it's secondhand, but from a very reliable source. I did another time attend a uh, sort of a working group, what a uh, Mo mission working group, with a NASA group, and the NASA project manager was there, and he would periodically say things like, "You know, you guys know what you're supposed to find in this report, don't you? And if not." <coughs> I'll tell you what you're supposed to find. And I, so it was so bad. I'm, I wasn't funded. I was just there as trying to help out. Uh, I finally said to the guy, look, if you want to write the report, you can write it on the airplane going home, but cut out these threats. Uh, that goes on. I don't know if everybody is, knows that or if nobody knows it, but there's bullying that goes on. The reason I... It absolutely does, but why? Given I, yeah. I don't know. I'm, that's, that's what I'm saying. This is the situation that exists. It existed in a few years ago. I'm a little out of date. I don't believe it changed. Is it comparable at other agencies, or is it something unique to NASA, and, and why might that be? Uh, I think at, at NIST that would never happen. I just, I, I don't know. It still exists. Yeah. Dewey, it happens. Yeah. I bet USGS it wouldn't happen. Uh, so it's, I don't know. Uh, anyway, a friend of mine once said, uh, anyone that can't stand a little criticism probably needs some. <laughs> and so I've taken that to heart. Usually when I introduce myself, I call myself a uh, lab physicist. I had a PhD years ago, but that was actually how long ago? Vacuum tubes. Uh, <laughs> But I, and I'm calling myself a recovering congressional staff member. What am I recovering from? Arrogance and cynicism. 
But for this, just for this talk, I'm slipping back into my old congressional staff mode of arrogance and cynicism. So let me move ahead. Uh, oh, one more mention about NASA's sensitivity. Did any of you know John Ladwig, who was around yes. headquarters for a while? Good guy. He was asked to put together a plan for, at one point, for a policy office, space policy office in headquarters, and he sent it to me for my comments. And actually, I never commented because I couldn't, I just couldn't think of anything to say that would be constructive. He, he, here's the plan, and it was all about defending NASA from outside attacks, nothing about possibly changing any NASA policies that would keep from attacking it, you know. And I just never commented, you know. Uh, so that's, here we go, let's take off running. And I, I should say, I know NASA does a lot of wonderful things. I spoke about Matt Mountain and the Space Telescope. They, uh, the astronauts are wonderful people. I uh, got to be friends of some of them. Uh, but there is this kind of other stuff that goes on, some things. Another observation, NASA operates in a very political context, some of which, much of which they have constructed. And uh, let me give you an example. When, at the time when the space station was sort of just ramping up and everybody knew that it was you know, going to ramp up 200 million, 400 million, a billion, and on up, and the Congress needed to it was a kind of time of year when Congress is really in a budget hawk mode, deficit hawk mode, medium, you know. Uh, they wanted to cut a big project, and there were two things coming along, the super collider and the station. And there were some very close votes for a couple of years in a row. One time the station survived by only one vote, 204 to 205, or vice versa. Uh, but at that time I saw these notebooks that NASA had proposed to, to show all the projects that were going to be funded in every congressional district if the space station was built. And that's another silly thing. It just says the space program is a source of pork, and it leads members to think of it that way, and it leads them to say, well, maybe next year I want to get more for myself. So that's how you can construct your own political environment. I, I thought something that's never been tried is just to say, of that sort of thing. We're the good guys. We don't do that. And just take the high road. I, I think NASA is so popular, they would do much better that way. Uh, would Barbara Mikulski agree with you? I think so. I, you know, she certainly takes care of the S Space Telescope Science Institute. But on the other hand, that's something worth taking care of. So it's, it's not like a machine shop that's making stainless steel bolts for some uh, another th observation, and th this not being a science agency is something that just keeps breaking the hearts of sciences, scientists, because, and I, I've had a lot of them tell me, NASA shouldn't do this, they're a science agency. Bullshit, they're not a science agency. Let me tell you what I mean by a counterexample. Years ago, Herb York, and like in the Nixon administration, he was a, uh, something like the deputy or Assistant Secretary of Defense for R&D. And he was getting bombarded by, you know, DOD should do this in space, DOD should do that. He said, look, for us, space is a place, not a mission. In other words, if we need to do something in space, we'll do it in space. But we're not going to space <coughs> just to go into space. On the other hand, NASA is a space agency. They have to find things to go into space. So they want to launch rockets, so they ask scientists, can you give us something to put on top of this rocket? That's what it's about. That's one of the thermodynamics of this situation. It's the, it's the second law of thermodynamics for, uh, next slide, for space. The first law of thermodynamics is that, you know, you, money drives the system. You got this high temperature reservoir full of money, and then down here you have a low temperature reservoir with no money in it. You try to put an engine in between open the valve and the money flows down, you hopefully you get a little work as, <laughs> as it goes on. So it's just a thermodynamic system going on. This is the U.S. Treasury. This is aerospace contractors and universities. 
and this little engine is NASA here in the middle. Uh, so, next is uh, NASA starved for funds. You have bad management, including putting too much on their plate, makes it starved for funds. On the other hand, they have enough money that they, they try brute force solutions too often. Cadwell Johnson, who was a designer, Max Faget colleague at JSC for years, he said, you do your best thinking when you've got no money. And too often NASA has so much money, they try to brute force things through the system. The best example of that, well, there are a lot of examples, but uh, let me see what I want to talk about here. The best example is in the, when the, in the early days of the station program, when they spent literally hundreds of millions of dollars on asking people what they wanted to do about, about on the station. Now that became the mission of the station. And then they designed this big Taj Mahal, what was the first ver space station, Freedom, I think. They found that they couldn't build it because they had assumed that the way to keep costs down is to minimize the pressurized volume, minimize the volume of life support system. So they put everything they could on the outside, then they finally figured out that by doing mean time between failure calculations that the astronauts are going to spend all their time going out and changing light bulbs. You know what I mean? All, everything was out there, something was going to be so breaking all, every, all the time, so you're having pre-breathing time and out and then post-breathing or whatever you do and they wouldn't get any work done, so they redesigned it. They spent literally billions of dollars on six consecutive redesigns of the station. That was, what they attempted was a brute force creationist design of the space station. <laughs> Creationism can be done by God who is omniscient and omnipotent. It can't be done by mere humans. Humans have to do evolution. That's the beauty of evolution. It should have started with the extended duration orbiter, then some little experience, experience you carry up and throw overboard from the shuttle. You should have moved up, maybe eventually have sort of a, a bus out there you can plug experiments into. Then have a, a tent for camping out so an astronaut can camp out outside of the shuttle. And you could find out what a station might possibly be good for. And then build a little bitty station. Bob? Well, just to make sure I understand your point, you're contrasting a creationist kind of Adaptive management. Approach. Adaptive management, sure. That's it's that's what it, that's evolution. It's 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 something that Simon called procedural rationality. Take a step, stop, look around. Take another step, stop, look around. You don't it's think that the accomplished that? That hard? that helped. That helped, sure. But then, if it, it had really had accomplished it, why did NASA screw up so bad and need six redesigns at a cost of several billion dollars? In fact. Redesigns have never stopped. They just quit calling them redesigns. And it's been, in fact, it has been evolutionary. They, the first version was this, and the next one 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 was this. And you know, now they're going to complete station by 2010, or what's it called? Final design or something like that. And that's the final shrinking down. But they got there by the most expensive possible approach. So that's what makes the funding. That. Is it a high-tech agency? Yes, with some glaring, and the yes answer is obvious, but then the other, th the, sh the shuttle was built, the orbiter was built with uh, computers from the B-1 bomber. Two reasons. One, it was already flight tested in the B-1 bomber, and two, Rockwell built both the B-1 and the orbiter. So, but that's not high-tech, that's not pushing the envelope. Uh, another example was the, uh, let's go to the next should be a, a little uh, drawing. The decision to uh, launch the Challenger. This was a view graph that uh, Roger Beaujolais used to brief his management at Morton Thiokol. And it's the temperature at launch versus the uh, burn, amount of burn through of the O-rings. And that was the data that he showed his managers. And I just, I don't know, this is my handwritten version, but it looked basically like that. And so management said, you can't find a trend in that data, so let them launch the son of a bitch. He did not plot all the other flights, about 18, I believe, that, that were around in here. 
that had no damage at all. But they were all at warm temperatures, and you know, maybe some in the summertime. Uh, so now suddenly you can draw a line, right? I mean, it goes something like that. And it's a bad bet to launch that thing. So that's, that's what I mean. It's a high-tech agency, but sometimes they really screw up in, on the really fundamental things. And, er and everybody knew that. It wasn't a secret. They also, at, at the time of that launch, they knew about the stuff falling off the external tank. But that had already been given a permanent waiver, whatever that's called. I forget. Let's move ahead to the next. Uh, what was the number they lost because of the screw between metric conversion? Yeah, that was another that's example. But that, that, I don't know, that was just sort of a one time thing. But I think the trouble is that the, the decision to launch Challenger when they shouldn't have, and the t decision to launch the Columbia when they shouldn't have, were the same problem. They had given a permanent waiver to some problems. They sort of, it was a, as Diane. What's her name, Diana? Diana Vaughn. Vaughn said, you know, it was a normalization of the DNC. Let's see. Let's don't talk about the Bush Moon Mars program, except to say that they, it's another creationist thing. They're going to go ahead, and, and, and they've already got deadlines. They've decided what they're going to do, and it just doesn't make any sense. The point of this is that if an agency that's having this kind of problems is really sort of flying around trying to exist and getting an environment just way below the signal level, in my opinion, my arrogant, cynical opinion. So let's go to the next uh, one and talk about some things we might do. And this is equally arrogant and cynical. Uh, we need to start over, but it's going to be federal for a long time. We want to don't make that a permanent situation, but it's, I think we can't count on the private sector to s or any commercial to save us anytime soon. You remember Jim Abramson at one point was trying to commercialize this, the shuttle program. Jim Abramson, I think, is a fine person, but there's just no way the shuttle program could be commercialized because a commercial venture, I don't know if this is part of the definition or part of the criteria, you have to allow it to fail. We couldn't allow the shuttle to fail, so it could never really be commercial. Another, the thermodynamics was just not on your way there. So we got a, we, we got a big, to get out of the federal stuff, we got a hard job. Let's go to the next one. Good, thanks, that's perfect. Uh, here are the kind of, I think, yeah. These are, some, in the renovation, we, we want to keep uh, where can I put my finger? Get out of the way of the private efforts and don't subsidize them, which the private guys say we're private sector guys, but they always come in and want some federal money. And as a, somebody that worked for Congress, I guarantee you that's, they, they're going to be there. But don't subsidize them, don't penalize them. Decide what we need to do in-house and then have enough in-house capability to really monitor it now. And, and NASA, in my opinion, doesn't have that. There are some things that should be done by this kind of adaptive management where you, you, you put out 100 experiments and see what works and you throw away 90 and propagate the 10 that are working and then put out another 100 and you, and you really begin to find out what's really working. But that takes, takes as much personnel effort to monitor one small project or five small projects as one big one. And they don't have the, the personnel to do that. So the contractors uh, can do too much on their own. Uh, we need a lot of cooperation. And uh, uh, I said in this summary, just in, with other nations, but with other agencies across, I'm going to later say we should split NASA up. So sort of intra-old NASA, a lot of cooperation. But we need to cooperate um, as among equals. Mo the cooperation on the space station, somebody spoke and said there's a great, they had a great agreement and it was followed. But the, the thermodynamics of that cooperation was, we're going to build a space station. Do you guys want to tag along? And I think there was an agreement. We're probably doing the least we can do to satisfy it. 
but it's not, it's not really cooperation. I agree we, if we're going to send somebody to Mars, we probably want to figure out how we can do that and not, and not end up dithering when somebody's halfway to Mars. But the, or just say we're not cooperating. Avoid creationism. Next view graph, please. And that's, again, just the same. And it's harder to do the adaptive management when you're doing something like go to Mars. There's a point when you have to hit the launch button, and that's harder. I think it would, it's at least worth thinking about breaking NASA into four parts. These are four. You, you could do it some other way. My, but the, point, the real point is to give each of these basic missions some cultural breathing room. It now seems to me that we've got a, an agency that is, is a human spaceflight agency. And this would certainly put a lot more diversity. So let's go to the next one. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm nobody, at least I'm not seeing anything being thrown at me. I expected by now to have a lot of it. Okay, good. Uh, beg your pardon? Okay. Uh, what we're to I'm coming through all those again. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to go down to four. Do you want to talk about the first paragraph of the last slide? Okay. So, uh, put science in NSF. That would be good for both agencies. NSF is just, just cannot do big science, and the more and more they need to do it. And they, they, they're way too bound up with university grants. If they want to do big science, now if they want to do something else, I mean, you know, they're going to have a hell of a time building the next big ground telescope when they're going to have to raise as much money as a space telescope. When, when you get up to a 100 meter ground telescope, that's going to be a honking big telescope. Uh, so JPL maybe would, for example, go with this part of the NASA. Earth science, where are we? Yeah. Okay, let's go to the, the next one. I'm sorry, I got out of order. I didn't have a mark on that. No, I, some, I got something out of order here. Maybe, maybe the view. You, you haven't finished the last, the previous slide. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, okay. There we go. Did I describe? Yeah, okay. That's okay, fine. I'm sorry. Space kinds, NFF. This is, this is sorry, this might continue to be called NASA. It would do th uh, things like man rating a launch vehicle, do, do the crew capsules. Uh, this seems a natural, just add it to the weather satellites. Uh, it's, it, some applications aren't Earth science related, but I don't know how much NASA is doing in applications that's not related to the Earth anymore. Are they still doing any communications experiments? I don't, I don't think so. Now, we are still doing aeronautics. Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, I think that's going to be wiped out pretty soon. And, but I, this is a sketch. This is not the final painting. Uh, okay. Infrastructure, this would be tracking and data, deep space network, uh, that sort of thing. Oh, the launch, launch stuff, developing of a new launch vehicle. And I don't know whether that, sh I think if you, if you don't put the new launch vehicles in here, then you might as well put seven and four together. But that's what I would do. If you give, oh, great, thank you. Uh, That, there are a lot of unresolved issues. Sun Earth stuff, solar terrestrial stuff. It's science, but it's Earth, sun's Earth science. I mean, you just got to work it out. Robotics is, I, you know, to me, robotics is not an end in itself, but it's instrumental. So you, here's again where you want these guys to cooperate. And I don't want to put it one place. It's like computers. You're not going to have computers in one place. Everybody's going to have a computer. But there, is, but there is maybe, I don't know, I think, you know, that's, that's a vertical column, I think. 
Uh, have I said every, is there any question on this slide right now? You know, obviously, JSC goes with, with the uh, Johnson people and, uh, I mean, with the uh, human people and maybe some people. Uh, some of the, like Goddard and has a lot of Earth stuff and JPL has a lot of Earth stuff too. So it's this, this is not perfect, but I think something like this needs to be done. Uh, we need, we talked about, I think we need to go management changes. Uh, this, the theory is that you need an Apollo type bell shaped curve for everything that happens. And that is the most efficient way to do things if the money comes on time and if the technology comes on time. Since that's never been known to happen, <laughs> it's kind of silly to plan programs that way. So I, what you have a much better chance of doing is more or less level funding or level funding with real dollars, maybe just a little inflationary growth, a little up and down. I think we learn how to manage programs that way. We also need to learn for credibility how to manage them, how to manage costs. Uh, you need, uh, right now, I don't see any real incentive to manage costs. Cost plus contracts, no incentive there. Uh, I've been, I'm, I'm afraid I've been party to some sordid things where the people managing the James Webb program in a contract in Goddard sort of colluded to do false estimates of costs that everybody knew were false, but to, because Sean O'Keefe was trying to kill the program, they promised to do things they knew very well they couldn't do. And that's, that's not ethical. Uh, finally, I think cooperation has to be, uh, you know, you have to prove you can cooperate. So that'd be, for example, I, w I would like to see somebody come in saying, on my budget I want to do this and I'm going to cooperate with these other people and we've done all this great robotics stuff. And, you know, we, t we took the funding you gave us and gave half of it to somebody that did a better job on a particular thing that they have a skill in. Uh, one incentive here would be to fire a few program managers and terminate some programs. I don't know if that's ever happened either for cost overruns. Now that's a pretty brutal incentive, but I don't think you'd have to exercise it very often. We, have, we do have a new uh, associate minister for, for science. We do. He's a mean son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Alan worked for me for a while, and I didn't I did ever try to tell him what to do. <laughs> uh, so, summary conclusions. I think there's nothing on that, so yeah, that we really need to do things differently. And I think maybe if we could get some, a better managed agency, we could add some more criteria to the way we're trying to do things, and one of them would be an environmental ethic. And that's my last view graph, my last statement. <laughs> Yay, hi. Um, hi. Very interesting. I'm wondering what you think about um, reorg idea. A lot, uh, there's definitely dual purpose issues in NASA that I wonder what your ideas are about, that there's a military, I mean, even if you look at the launch of the shuttle, like everyone four has a military mission or something associated with it. And I know like s the U.S. Space Command is also, you know, vying for resources to develop stuff for national missile defense and all that. And I mean, certainly there's, what's the connection that if at all between U.S. Space Command and the dual purpose um, in a, uh, uh, Well, I, I don't... I mean, I'm, dual purpose is something that's happening in NASA, right? I mean... No, the, no, uh, no. I don't... I don't the, challenge the Air Force won't walk completely away from it after challenge. Yeah. But there's, if you look at the schedule of the shuttle, they have military... No, no, not a, since Yeah, like a month ago, I went online, and you could just look at what they're doing military. Go online, check out the schedule. And I, I, it doesn't bother me with the shuttle. I think you'll find it. 
the military has its biggest space the program. Challenges. Well, I know, and that's but another question I want to ask is here we are asking about NASA and their ethics, and yet there's nothing we can ever, what, what, how can we affect ethics within the U.S. Space Command and the Air Force? I, I, the you know, they're, I think, for example, in space debris, they're going to cooperate for their own good. They're not going to be going to planets, so we don't have to worry about that. Their launches aren't any better or worse than NASA. Uh, the, I, the, I'll get to you in a minute. Or unless, so I, I'm not worried by that. I think I'm more worried about the idea that we're going to have a missile defense than any kind of dual interaction or anything like that. I mean, it's, we're, it's just it's a, another technological mirage. Well, when there's a request in the 08 budget to have $10 million for the Missile Defense Agency to study space-based uh, interceptors and space-based yeah. testing, so they're going to need... million? That's nothing. No, just to start looking at it. So it's not out of the you question know, that they're looking, looking at space-based... Nice. Space-based... Um, yeah. So who's got, you know, so what part of NASA or like who's... I don't know. Uh, just that interconnection. I, I, I would, I hope that doesn't. One of the most encouraging things that ever happened was early in the station program, I got a visit from Frank Gaffney from the Department of Defense. You know him? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I had one on. Uh, oh, okay. Well, get the recording. No. <laughs> uh, Frank Gaffney, who's a, he was one of these neocon right-wing nuts, and he came to visit me and talked very quietly the whole time because my office wasn't, it was an open connection between the other offices. But uh, he, he came and said, we want to be able to put weapons on the space station. And the, what was encouraging was that they, they, that they asked. <laughs> you know, I mean, they didn't just do it. I, mean, if, I think with you, if I had your mindset, I would assume, and I, I don't mean that in a derogatory, I would say, they're just going to put the damn weapons on, and then we'll find out about it when you know one of them accidentally goes off or something like that. But uh, and I, I don't, I don't think that ever happened. You know, was, I think it was just some wild guys that wanted to, didn't know what they were talking about. I think uh, Who's, was somebody? Yeah, will you cop, cop, call on people? Yeah. Mark's going to call them. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to comment a little bit about um, cooperation. How I've seen cooperation um, through about 25 years, and that is, it, it seems to me, when uh, early on we were uh, envisioning these programs, we saw they were very expensive, and we didn't know how we were going to accomplish them. Um, scientists, in and of their own, came up with this great idea that we would cooperate, and we started talking with, you know, people. In, I mean, the people we could talk with. Uh, uh, we we talked to the Russians. Uh, you know, contractors could even bring them on. You know, bring but um, we talked with them, we worked with them, and, and we tried to set things out so that we were cooperative, cooperating. And then we came through a period of time where it seems to me respective agencies were cooperating and putting things together. Now I sort of feel like tables are turned and we're so worried about what our technological um, uh, secrets are and how they're going to be um, you know, collected in some other entity some other um, political situation that we're stymied. You know, we fill out export uh, forms for taking, you know, little tiny laptops. That's why mine doesn't belong to the government because I'm tired of filling out those forms. You get them back and, you know, a month later you got to fill out another one. But the, the point of it is, you know, as a person we can try to do things and we can kind of move things through, but at some point we run into the bureaucracy of um, homeland security and national defense. I don't know what NASA can do about that. Well, no, you know, civilizations rise and fall. <laughs> so, and the, you know, the other, the other uh, wisdom of the ages I'll pass on is that when you lock the lab door, you lock more out than you lock in. We all know that, right? We all know both these things. It, it's, I don't know, we, we're going to have a rough time for a while, I think. But if we got to get an election in a year and a half, and begin turning things around. Hi, I'm Paul Davis. I work here at Ames. Good you for had you. had a number of interesting ideas there, and I, I have some comments and questions. 
transferring space science to NSF. I'm sure that would please NSF provided NASA's budget for space science goes with the transfer and they get the money to do it. I'm sure that would please Mike Griffin if he gets to keep that money and use it instead for exploration. That's the key behind that problem. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that people complain about is entrenched bureaucracies, and by bureaucracy I mean more than people who work for the government, I mean people who work for private industry, everyone who has an entrenched set of relationships. And when you're trying to establish the vision for space exploration, uh, a big problem is all these entrenched bureaucracies around the things NASA's already doing. Of course, what are you trying to do if you're establishing the vision for space exploration, which is going to take 10, 20, 30 years? Create an entrenched bureaucracy that will protect it so you can continue doing it. And then five years from now, when a miracle happens and I become NASA administrator, because science is what I like, I will be fighting against this now entrenched bureaucracy of of the vision for exploration in order to get what I want out of science and so on. So that's a question of problems that, that's related to the problems you identified and that are barriers to doing any of the things uh, that you indicate there. One solution that has occurred to me is that since NASA is interested in long-term projects, maybe it needs more separation from the presidency. Instead of appointing a new NASA administrator at will, maybe we need an independent board or a semi-independent board with like 10 or 15 years term of office and that each president gets to appoint one person to this board every four years and then they choose the NASA administrator. They decide the budget that goes to Congress. Uh, do you think something like that would have yeah. any advantage? Uh, I, I'm not a political theorist. Uh, you know. That's, that's a very interesting idea, and in fact, I did think about it, but I couldn't come up, I, I wish I'd talked to you earlier, I couldn't come up with any kind of umbrella to put over those four agencies. You probably would want some kind of umbrella, and maybe something like the Federal Reserve Board or something like that would be a good idea. Uh, bureaucracies, you know, they can be good or bad. I worked for the National Institute of Standards and Technology back in the 70s, and, and then I've I've been affiliated with them in various ways since then. They're definitely, in many respects, an, an entrenched bureaucracy. But they're all, and you know, one of the famous things about them is that, is that NIST is two old Civil War veterans guarding the standard kilogram. <laughs> but they, uh, they also, they do some wonderful stuff. And, and as, I, as far as I'm concerned, they're, they're a very good agency. They, they really you probably don't know this, but in the last probably 15 years, they've won three Nobel Prizes for mission-related work. Now, this is not for, every, not for the mission. One of their missions is to develop me test methods for hail resistance of roofing materials. I don't think they're ever going to win a Nobel Prize for that sort of work. But then what they do is develop the test method and then give it to the Roofing Materials Trade Association, and they then have a good way for setting standards. But the bureaucracies can be good, can be bad. Na one of NASA's biggest problems, and if you'll pardon me for it, being at a center, and Ames, I love Ames. I think Ames is a good center. When I was on the uh, SSAC, one of the only Space Science Advisory Committee, the only center that ever had any little notice up at the front gate as we drove in to meet here was Ames and they said, welcome SSAC. So we, we passed a resolution of appreciation at that meeting. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, the centers, and I, I think Marshall and jo or Johnson and Marshall are the two worst about this. People that go to work for a center and stay at that center all the way up. And I think you need something like, maybe more subtle than this, that you can't get promoted from a GS-13 to a GS-14 without going to another center, and then again from a 14 to a 15 without going. And for sure, if you get into the super grades, you should have to go back and forth. And not just back between Marshall and Johnson and Marshall and Johnson, but you know, you, you could say maybe you have an intervening center before you go back to the next center. 
at, because remember when Aaron Cohen was made director of Johnson? He had never had another job except JSC. You don't get any good ideas that way. Then poor Jess Moore came in and was just devoured and didn't last very long. The other, what was the guy, the astronaut crew chief, uh, the meanest man at Johnson Space Center? George Abbey. George Abbey, yeah. <laughs> you don't want to have a lot of George Abbeys floating around in the system. I mean, he was a, a real Nazi. And you could look at him and tell it. I mean, it doesn't. On that note, I think I have the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the stimulating. And let me say to everyone, in case there's any ambiguity, I'm going to speak as a personal, a human, not a NASA employee. Uh, quick comment on the military first. Uh, they, we have in this nation two space programs, each in the 15 to $20 billion a year range. Uh, and they used to be much more closely coupled than they are. The shuttle was a dual-use instrument until the, uh, the Challenger accident, at which point the Air Force backpedaled as quickly as it could and developed its own launch vehicles. Yes, they both launched from Kennedy, but completely different launch systems. Uh, and NASA has very, very few connections today with the military. Um, to you, Rand. Yes, sir. Um, these are both... Take these as constructive criticism so you can write a better chapter. Good. Um, Wait, could you, I'm, let's have, talk about it now. Will you send me an email? Sure. Okay. Sure. Uh, the first one good. is on the question of planning versus evolutionary development. Are you really sure evolutionary development works in space? Usually within NASA, one hears quite the other, that we need better systems engineering. We need better people who can think about big projects and plan them so that in fact, the coupling systems work and the thermal systems work and all of these things, which is just the opposite of what you were proposing. Well, not. I, I know the you know the things I pull together, but you know Eberhard Recton and his work on space on architecting. Who? Eberhard Recton. He was president of aerospace. Of aerospace. Yeah, but he, he he's written two really great books. One is the the art of space architecture. And he has these little heuristics, he calls them. And one of, the, one of his heuristics is, the biggest mistakes are made on the first day of the project. And the example, is that, what that means is, you have conscious assumptions that you start off with, and then they bite you in the rear end later on. And this one on the station where I said that the first assumption was that we've got to minimize pressurized volume. That bit, bit them in the, in the rear end after hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent trying to design that. As a, and the Fisher-Price study was the one that found out it wasn't going to work. Uh, so clearly, you know, couplings have to But what you want to do is postpone as many decisions as you can. You don't, you don't want to make decisions up front. It'd be interesting. That's almost the opposite of the way Oh, yeah, it is. Now. I'd say it's, it's the other way. Revolutionary. Yeah. Let me do the other one quickly uh, on dividing up NASA. It's almost the way we have it now, thanks largely to congressional intervention, because you know the, the space science is a is a five or six billion dollar enterprise itself. The shuttle operates, is the exploration is, and aeronautics is, and Congress, at least recently, has forbidden NASA to shift funds from one of those to the other. So in fact, they are almost independent and can make their own choices within their own budget of how to allocate activities at the moment. Now, if Congress did not make that distinction, then indeed you might raid one to support another. But right now, they're almost independent fives. Well, Brian, I know there is that prohibition. I think my impression, I, and you are much more on top of it than, than I am, was that there is also a provision for waivers, and that Griffin has gotten a lot of those waivers, and that's where some of the how some of the money has left the science programs. But I expect, for instance, if you talk to Alan Stern, he probably doesn't expect to get any more money, but I expect he feels he has the authority to shift things around within, within. The science. No, I'm talking about moving across. I think that I'm happens. I'm not sure how much difference that would make. It's just a thought. Well, you have four different administrators. That's, that would be different. We have time for one more question. Oh, let's go on. Let's keep going. Okay, Carl. 
Uh, Rad, I really like your talk too. I'd like to go back to this issue of, of management and planning, whether you do adaptive management or systems engineering. Uh, that's a debate within engineering too. Uh, that uh, for instance, in any design of, of any uh, large structure, uh, large building, uh, there's there's always, at least from what little bit I know of engineering, and the engineers that I've talked to are structural engineers and and, and work on large buildings. Um, there is just in almost in most cases exactly the same kind of thing you talked about at NASA. I mean, they have to redesign all the time, and on on really large buildings, they have uh, engineers on the spot redesigning daily because things come up in the process of construction where things have to be adjusted. Different bolts, different welding systems, different uh, pipes won't fit where the, uh, the architect thought they could go. So there's, how much are you asking for different than what is, seems to be necessary on any large project? Yeah, well, uh, as Dave, someone over here was saying, Everything has to fit together in a space station, for example. In a building like that, you, you don't say all of a sudden we've got to go from uh, U.S. ANSI scred throughs to metric scred, screw threads, I'm sorry. But you just, yeah, you move things around, but you, your system is not so rigorously determined that you can't do that. Apparently, the station was built in such a way that you had to start over things up. Uh, that was the trouble. It was so rigidly constrained. But the station, but the, see, the big problem in the station was we didn't know what good it was for. Yes. Uh, and so we, we, we kind of had to, we built it for one way, and then we built it for some other way, and then we built it for some. And even, even members of Congress, I remember poor Frank Martin coming up and saying, I'll tell you what it Mr. Chairman, it's a laboratory in space. And the chairman, Bob Rowe, said, I know it's a laboratory in space, but what's it for? One more from Maria. And then we'll take a break. I just can't let that pass. <laughs> there, we knew damn well what the space station was for, and we had a number of committees, both NASA internal committees. Uh, I was on more of them than I, hear, than I care and National Research Council uh, com committees on what the space station was for. Good answers, good facilities, first-rate questions. All came out as NRC, re NRC reports in life sciences, in material sciences, in earth observations, in uh, some so somewhat questionable in, in astronomy. The problem is not that they didn't know what it was for. The problem was that, like so many in this sad history, there was no follow-through. And I wonder why, you know, a brief sad story. You walk across the parking lot, which I did to try to get out of the cold, the other day, and you go through the NASA uh, visitor center here, and you see this graveyard of unfulfilled promises. You see the animal centrifuge that was supposed to be going up on the space station as part of the centrifuge accommodation module, sitting on the ground, built by the Japanese. You see the model of Sophia. Who knows whenever that's going to fly again? Great, uh, great opportunity but it's not, not in existence. You see the uh, advanced space station era uh, EVA hard suit that was developed here at NASA Ames. Never, never come to fruition. And I didn't have time to look at all the others. The, what, I, what I have found, uh, Brad, was the frustration was not the lack of planning. We had good planning and co-opted co off the scientific community very often into doing it, the lack of follow through, always jumping onto the next project before finishing the previous one. I couldn't agree more, and, and that the problem was the planning. It was silly to plan for that. There wasn't, because he knew there wasn't going to be any follow through. There's a one and a half billion dollar cosmic ray detector that's not going to fly. It's, it's one and a half billion dollars. B, yes. B. B. Yeah, I meant to say billion. Uh, that's, that's what I'm saying. We planned all this stuff without a bunch of flights of, to see what would really work, what was really. And my feeling is, even though we've just had a lecture, a talk, I mean, by you on how Big G really is effective on human beings, Big G is not really very big. So a lot of 
things don't make much difference, and you have to look hard to find a place where it does make difference. It, you know, so we, we had plans to do crystallization of turbine blades on the space station, and uh, we, I don't know. It's just, we needed to do a lot of preliminary work for 10 years. Instead of, re just in, for the same amount, for much less money and the same amount of time, we could have gotten a lot more real information about what's going to work and what's not going to work. And the, the, the uh, centrifuge is a disgrace, and I don't, you know, we're going to need moon to do the, what, the half gravity sort of stuff, but we don't have any variable gravity. Uh, but that's, there again, we, we, we didn't, NASA asked the scientists, what could we do in this, and so they said, that's what it's for. But NASA never really believed that. That's just breaking scientists' hearts again. It's not a science agency. Or Congress didn't supply the money. They, well, there's a hell of a lot of money been spent. It's a, Jim Beggs testified it was going to be $8 billion to build the whole thing, including launch costs. And where are we now, 45, something like that? Yeah. And, and not finished? Okay. Well, thanks. Let's have a 15-minute coffee.